Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. I am shooting from home because I am in a lot of pain and it's either going to go away or I'm going to need to go to like urgent care or the ER, but I'm not going to risk driving out and <sighs> I got my teddy bear keeping me company and we're going to talk about some news because I didn't give you a Thursday or Monday show and I just, I can't because of who I am. I just can't live with myself taking another day off. So, hey, hit that like button and let's just jump into it. Hey y'all, first up today, you know, we live in very challenging times. Everyone has different coping mechanisms, but I think that we can all get on the same page and say getting blackout drunk at your kid's sleepover, braiding preteens and then throwing up in a hamper not a good look, especially when you're running for Congress. But that's exactly what Abby Broyles, a Democratic candidate for Congress in Oklahoma, allegedly did. According to non-doc media, a journalism nonprofit in Oklahoma, Broyles was invited to a home of a friend who was hosting a sleepover for her daughter on February 11th, with it being attended by eight girls between the ages of 12 and 13. With the outlet reporting for multiple accounts of the evening, Broyles became intoxicated and spoke derogatorily to some of the girls. She allegedly called one girl an acne fucker, which prompted the girl to leave the room in tears. Broyles allegedly called another girl a Hispanic fucker and another a judgy fucker, and adding at one point Point, Royals allegedly vomited into a laundry basket and onto one girl's shoes. One of the 12-year-olds at the sleepover also told the outlet that Royals was initially nice, but then started randomly lashing out, saying we were all sitting around and she was just going around in a circle saying rude things and would end with fucker and saying fuck you to all of us there, adding she was telling me I wasn't going to be as successful as her. The 12-year-old also saying that Royals attempted to apologize, but that the homeowner did most of the talking, with the mother of the girl who left in tears also telling another local outlet that the candidate came to apologize to her daughter, but was too drunk to talk and threw up instead. And in addition to these details being corroborated by multiple girls, they were also backed up at a text message from the homeowner obtained by Nondoc where she apologized to the parents of the kids. But despite the fact that Broyles' presence at the party was confirmed to Nondoc in a statement from the homeowner and in pictures of her seen by the outlet, the candidate denied that she was ever there, telling Nondoc that she was out of town, calling the allegations awful and defensive and false, also implying this was a political attack cooked up by the moms at the sleepover. But seemingly when her shaggy defense wasn't working out, she later walked back her denial in an interview, admitting that she was in fact in attendance at the sleepover and apologizing for her behavior, but saying that she was blacked out after drinking wine and having a sleeping medication she had not taken before, saying it was given to her by the host of the party and adding, And I had an adverse reaction. Instead of helping me sleep, I hallucinated. And I don't remember anything until I woke up or came to and I was throwing up in a hamper. I want to say sorry from the bottom of my heart. I apologize for any hurt or damage or trauma that my behavior when I didn't know what I was doing caused. I'm deeply sorry. But then, despite the fact that she literally apologized for what happened, she appeared to backtrack yet again in a statement to the Associated Press yesterday. Once again, painting the story as a political attack and claiming that she doesn't believe she would have said the things that she's accused of saying. Saying the things I'm accused to have said are not who I am. They're not a reflection of my beliefs at all. It's clear this media smear campaign is politically backed and I won't stop fighting for Oklahomans. So it seems like she has no plans to drop out of the race. I really cannot wait to see what happens with her campaign next. But ultimately with this story, I kind of want to end it on two notes. The first being, Abby, you are our douchebag of the day. Like you can't even keep your story straight. You're like, I wasn't even there, but apparently there's photographic evidence of you being there. Like, who do you think you are, Prince Andrew? But also too, I do feel like I need to say thank you because you've set the bar so low for parents. Like I think most parents have that thought in their head, that intrusive thing, certain days where they're like, do I suck at this? But now we can collectively look at what you did and go like, oh no, apparently I'm killing it. So this may be the first time, but thank you to our douchebag of the day. And then in entertainment slash social media, it feels even weird to label it that way. Uh, you should expect to see David Dobrik's name and face on social media and in the news a lot more in the near future. Like for reasons that he is probably not gonna be very happy about. And to a lesser degree, we're already seeing some of that happen now. Right, Dobrik, for the most part, has completely rebounded from his past scandals. The first of which, of course, was the sexual assault allegation against a member of the blog squad, the group that he keeps around him. With people at that time going after David specifically, saying that he created this environment where this could happen. And then during and after dealing with that fallout, he had to deal with the Jeff Wittick situation. Jeff, seemingly a friend of David Dobrik, a member of this blog squad, and a horrible, horrible accident happened. Right, during the pandemic, David wanted to do this massive comeback vlog, right? We got to raise the stakes. What's this going to be? And it led to a stunt where you had David Dobrik operating his camera to film and operating an excavator that had a rope attached to it and Jeff Wittick was swinging around it. And if you just watch the video, which I don't think I can put it in this without the, this show getting suppressed, and it's like instantly recognizable how 
dangerous this is. And ultimately you see Jeff slam against the side of this metal excavator. Like it was a truly horrifying sight and you see it and you're like, how is that guy not dead? And luckily, and I'm using air quotes and I use that very loosely, like the only thing that happened to Jeff is he had, his face was maimed. His eye in particular being severely damaged. One of the really interesting things that happened at the time all of this started coming out is I think really one of the only reasons that David Dobrik still continued to have a career after all of this is the guy he almost killed ended up defending and protecting David. Not just not suing David for almost killing him, but like literally holding his water for him because David notoriously does not do interviews regarding scandals or leave comments regarding scandals. But it appears now there may be a crack in the dam. With Jeff Wittick, who actually recently had his ninth surgery for his eye, saying during a live stream in response to a question of, hey, has David checked in on you? He says, Nope, not a text or nothing. Uh, not surprised, you know? It is what it is, but I'm done being fake friends with that mother. Like yeah. I mean, it is what it is. You know, that's how he is. And I tried enough to protect his image and, you know, now I just don't give a I don't follow them on Instagram. Mostly because this sucks and I don't want to see it, but he can't send the text and be like, hey, I know your surgery was like 30%, maybe you'll lose your eye or not. But um, nothing, you know, he promoted his vlog. With Wittick also taking swings at Dobrik on social media, dunking on him by saying that he's balding, calling him a straight up sociopath, right? And all of this seeming to kind of create this narrative that David Dobrik, now that like he's no longer under fire, kind of just doesn't care, right? His career was saved, he limited the bleeding, and now fuck you. And like I said, without getting into specifics, in the coming weeks, there's going to be massive coverage in the news and very likely a lot of talk on social media regarding what happened during this time. And more importantly, after the accident. The only question is how it will paint David Dobrik, right? Is he just kind of a, a stupid kid that made a mistake or is he just a straight up sociopath who uses people like palms? And I have to say of Jeff, and I, I don't know the guy on a personal level, but just watching from the outside in, this does have to be pretty fucking soul crushing for him. You know, looking at these clips of Jeff more openly talking about the situation, for me, it's hard not to feel for this guy. Or you see moments where he opens up where he's like, you know, I'm nervous, we have a lot of the same friends, and there's this kind of known thing that if you, you kind of leave the vlog squad or you're not tight with David anymore, you kind of just, you're on your own island. So it's like you see the pressure there and then seemingly in the moment you have this guy like, I'm there for you, buddy. Oh my God, I can't believe this happened. And now you seemingly have Jeff, you know, acknowledging, oh, that's fake friend bullshit. And personally, I'm still kind of just blown away by the fact that he never sued David Dobrik. And I, and I wonder if he still could because I think that he should sue him. Like I believe uh, when all this happened, Jeff said that David was going to pay his medical bills. But the damage he did to you is so much greater than that. Like in addition to the emotional damage, the amount of time this kept you out of making content, like, you, I'm trying to think about how to say it, but I mean, kind of just straightforward. Jeff Wittick, you are a beautiful man. Like there's no reason that modeling wouldn't be a massive part of your future and your business and your income stream. And this motherfucker, in addition to putting your life at risk, your, your sight at risk, he changed the way your face looks for life. I understand that a lot of people have loyalty to him because he helped, you know, like create their career and he helps like let careers survive, but like he fucked you. And what I'll say, because I'm not you, right? I'm like, I'm outside looking in on this story. But one personal thing I can say, one of the only actual regrets I have in my life is choosing in the moment to not sue someone I rightfully could because I didn't want to have to deal with all of that. But then later feeling like, wow, that those that person, those people fucked me and used me. But hey, that's the story, some of my personal opinion. And of course, now I pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts? But from that, I wanna take a second to thank today's sponsor, KiwiCo. KiwiCo makes really awesome hands-on projects and activities aimed at inspiring young innovators as well as defining the future of play by making it engaging and fun. Each crate is designed to expose kids to a wide range of concepts in STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, math, and overall, they're a fantastic resource for learning at home. These monthly crates are designed by experts, tested by kids, and teach a new theme through hands-on learning and fun. Basically, KiwiCo wants kids to be fearless innovators by designing projects to help develop those skills. And one of the key things as a parent is that KiwiCo includes everything you need, so no more running out for extra supplies. And honestly, Lindsay and I love how the crates provide hours of entertainment for the kids and provide an opportunity for special moments with them as we do the projects together. Not to mention, KiwiCo is a solid option for holiday gifting. They offer eight subscription lines, each catering to different age groups and topics from toddlers up to adults. So if you want to check it out, just head on over to kiwico.com slash where you can get 30% off your first month of any crate. And then amidst all the horrible shit 
going on in the world, we have a story of freedom, bravery, and courage. Beat Hank the Tank, alternatively known as King Henry by some, and this 500 pound black bear has been burglarizing dozens of homes near Lake Tahoe since last summer, and now he's on the run from police, having now eluded California authorities for over seven months, during which time he's enjoyed all manner of West Coast cuisine. Using his massive weight to barge into locked and occupied homes and ransack them for food, he's reportedly damaged 33 properties and broken into at least 28 homes so far, with the most recent one ravaged over the weekend. With Hank smashing a window and squeezing into the house where no one was home, the cops show up, they knock on the outside until Hank left through the back door and disappeared into the woods, with two more break-ins being reported afterwards. And most of the activity came last fall as Hank went on a food binge in preparation for the winter. But, seemingly because there was just so much available food, he said, fuck it, and skipped hibernation. And now, you have authorities saying he is very dangerous because he's become comfortable around humans and associates them with food. In fact, local police have tried to haze him with paintballs, beanbags, tasers, and sirens, all to no effect, adding that they may have to eventually euthanize him when they finally catch him. But other wildlife activists say that he should just be delivered to a sanctuary instead, saying Hank the Tank hasn't actually hurt anyone yet, he's just hungry. And with this, we've seen a wave of support for the bear, both on social media as well as op-eds like in the Washington Post titled Hank the Tank Offers a Vision of a Better Life, with John Paul Brammer arguing in it that the bear continues a tradition of animals breaking out of human bondage and running from their captors to the cheers of onlookers. In this, also noting the pair of llamas who escaped into a Phoenix suburb back in 2015, as well as the zebras fleeing their breeder in DC and Javelina sprinting through Tucson. And Brammer's saying in this, personally, I would be rather upset if I stepped into my kitchen to find an apex predator rummaging through my pantry. Yet I, along with a growing chorus of people following Hungry Hank's saga, find myself cheering him on and booing the officials trying to end his spree. And so with this, I gotta pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts about Hank the Tank here? And then let's talk about this Ohio doctor that's been charged with 14 counts of murder. This for reportedly administering lethal doses of fentanyl to patients. And in court yesterday, he claimed that he was just providing comfort care for dying patients and not trying to kill them. So the doctor in question, William Husel, was indicted back in 2019 for prescribing excessive amounts of the dangerous drug to patients at the Mount Carmel Health System from 2015 until 2018, when he was ultimately pulled from patient care and fired. And at the time the indictment came down, a spokesperson for the hospital said that at least 34 patients were affected by his actions. This included 28 who received excessive and potentially fatal doses of the drug, and six others who received excessive doses that were not believed to be the cause of their deaths. With William initially charged with 25 counts of murder, but prosecutors later dismissed 11 of those charges, with the doctor also pleading not guilty to the remaining 14. In the opening statement for the trial, William's lawyer argued that the accused murderer was just helping his patients, saying this is not a murder case and it's far from it. William was exercising compassion to his patients and tried to free them from pain and let their last moments on earth be ones of peace. But prosecutors argued that multiple patients were, quote, not sick enough that they were destined to die during their hospitalization. Also noting how high the doses he administered were, claiming that he gave 600 to 2,000 micrograms at a time instead of the recommended 50 to 100 micrograms. But as far as what happens next, what we will see, we have to wait. The trial is expected to last two months, and if William is found guilty of any of the murder counts, he could face life in prison. And then, you know how we talked about the, the so-called freedom convoy in Canada, that movement spreading? One of the big questions right now is, is an offshoot of this convoy going to try and mess up the U.S. State of the Union next week? That's a major concern for top leaders in D.C. and why we saw the Pentagon authorizing the deployment of around 700 National Guard troops to the nation's capital yesterday. According to reports, trucker convoys modeled after the protests in Canada have been planned on various online forums and have different starting points and dates, with some scheduled to arrive around Biden's State of the Union speech on March 1st or shortly after. And notably, right now, it's unclear if any of the truckers plan to shut down the streets of D.C. entirely like they did in Ottawa. With D.C.'s Department of Homeland Security saying that while the mayor has been briefed, no permit application for a demonstration has been filed with the D.C. police, which requested the aid of the Guard. Also, some convoy leaders have said that they want to just roll through the city, but focus on shutting down the beltway, which surrounds the Capitol. But officials still want to be prepared because, as Axios notes, the Capitol riot has left officials wary of miscalculating security risks. In fact, officials are even reportedly considering reinstalling the fence that was put up after the insurrection. But for now, we'll have to wait and see how all this plays out. And then the situation between Ukraine and Russia continues to escalate with reports indicating that Russia is planning to further invade Ukraine. Where Russia already has troops in the Donbass territories that have declared independence, but those territories only control like 30% of the land they lay claim to. But also now those claims are backed up by Russia. So it's pretty apparent that actual combat between Ukrainians and Russians was a possibility. However, it's not a controversial belief that Russia won't just stop at securing the Donbass for the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. It's likely that Putin is trying to implement some kind of regime change in Kyiv to secure a more pro-Russian government and keep Ukraine out of NATO, or annex more land to secure a water supply for Crimea, or just rebuild the USSR one piece at a time, or quite frankly, all of the above. But with the threat of a Russian invasion of territory the Ukrainian military actually controls, we saw the country call up reservists aged 18 to 16 this morning for a maximum of one year, meaning tens of thousands of more troops with combat experience. However, this call-up won't be backed up by a general mobilization, possibly because it could be seen as completely abandoning diplomacy, and the Zelensky government likely is still holding on to some hope that fighting won't take place. And you have Putin claiming he's still supports a diplomatic solution, but that's also a little bit ironic considering he's already invaded the country. However, no general mobilization is a risky move. It could put Ukraine
Ukraine on its back foot if and when fighting breaks out, which is expected to happen in the next 48 hours or so. Also, beyond calling for more troops, Ukrainian officials have urged the 3 million Ukrainians living in Russia to leave over concerns for their safety. And Ukraine has also imposed a nationwide state of emergency this morning in order to keep the country calm amid the crisis. The state of emergency will last for at least 30 days, but could be extended to 60 total. And in Ukraine, this status gives authorities the power to restrict travel, ban strikes, or place extra protections on critical infrastructure, although it's unclear which the government is putting in place just yet. At the more local level, officials can place curfews and other restrictions. And this may seem like a drastic step, but beyond a Russian invasion, authorities are also worried about a possible economic collapse, with these measures supposed to cushion against that. However, some feel they don't go far enough, and with the current tensions, some lawmakers are calling for martial law. The head of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council saying those measures aren't necessary yet, but, quote, if necessary, this provision will be adopted immediately. But ultimately, that is where we are right now, though by the time that you see this, something else big might have happened, because this is a big developing situation. One where hopefully things do calm down, we don't actually see massive fighting between Ukraine and Russia, because, I mean, if that breaks out, it's expected to be the worst war in Europe since World War II. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. As always, thank you for watching, liking, subscribing, all the good stuff. My name is Philip DeFranco. I am going to hopefully sleep for the next 18 hours. I love your faces, and I'll see you tomorrow, probably. Maybe.